It's Astros baseball tonight from the Pacific Northwest. Seattle Mariners host the Houston Astros at Safeco Field in the first of a three game set. After a long night and morning of travel, Mariners also coming home. Happy to be back at Safeco after wrapping up a nine game road trip yesterday in California. Astros 6 and 13, Mariners are 9 and 9. From the Root Sports Studios in downtown Houston, Texas, it's Astros pregame presented by Toyota. He's Mike Stanton. I'm Brett Dolan. I think Ryan Hannigan just fouled off another pitch in that 12th <laughs> inning. <laughs> Tough game last night. Yes. Uh, certainly a disappointing way to finish off a homestand instead of a series victory and a positive note to have that long trip out to Seattle. Uh, another tough one for the hometown team. Yeah, it really was, and especially with the long trip. You get a long time to think about that that game. And unfortunately, they didn't win, but there were, again, there were things to take away from it. They fought back from a deficit, got off to a tough start. There was some shoddy defense early. They cleaned that up later in the game. So there were definitely some good things to think about. Unfortunately, they weren't able to chalk one up in the win column. It can't get Colby Rasmus to bat to every inning. That would help because <laughs> that would be nice, he right? was one of the true positives last night. In fact, down to the final out in the ninth inning, Hitting Craig Kimbrell on the mound, almost automatic. And Colby Rasmus comes through with another ball. One of the best closers in all of baseball over the last three years. And Colby just does what he's done this whole season so far, especially this week. You know, he, this is a guy that has not been able to put it together for long stints in his career. But we've actually seen this over the last couple years in short stints. We saw it in the playoffs last year where he lit up uh, all the playoff teams. I'll tell you what, his timing is remarkable. You know, he's a skinny guy. You know, this isn't a guy that's a big, powerful swing. But my gosh, does he have some bat speed? He's got some pop in that stick. And, you know, with him doing what he's done over the last week, he is actually the AL Player of the Week voted by Major League Baseball. So congratulations to Colby and what an incredible run he's been on lately. Mike, he's not missing pitches. We know he's taking his walks. That's somewhat new. But when that pitch is in the zone, Kimbrell thought he made a pretty good pitch right. last night, and Rasmus still hit it beyond the bullpen. Well, Brett, that's the key. The key is when a pitcher makes a mistake, what does the hitter do with it? And right now, Colby's squaring up the ball. He's doing it, and he's not just doing it for singles. He's doing it for doubles. He's hitting the ball out of the ballpark in big situations. Here's the grand slam of just a few days ago off of Houston native Clay Buckholz. I mean, he is just doing absolutely remarkable things. When the pitcher makes the mistake, he's not just hitting it, he's crushing it. He's making them pay, and for that, the American League Player of the Week, and that means the Houston Astros, well, they've run the table. There was a tie, of course, in Week 2, Mark Trumbo and Jose Altuve, but how about the Astros with a Player of the Week to start the season three straight times. It's pretty incredible, especially when you look at this team's record with only six wins to have guys swing the bat as well as they have, they have. And so there has been positives. I mean, this is not this is not a situation that everybody on the team is struggling. They're just struggling as a whole. You win as a team, you lose as a team. And even though these guys have gotten some uh, personal accolades, I guarantee you every single one of them would give all that up if they could turn their record around. No doubt. Of course, week two, a co-player of the week with Altuve and Trumbo. Colby Rasmus, though, the sole winner this week. And let's hear from Colby Rasmus. Things going on that just kind of happen, and I mean it's hard to say, you know, in in short what what it is. I guess I mean it's just kind of going that way for me right now. Um, just trying to stay on uh, my swing and what I'm trying to do, uh, keeping good rhythm, uh, working with Hudgy on uh, hand position and all kind of stuff. Just trying to stay on top of what they're going to try to pitch to me and and how I can combat what they're going to what their approach is to try to get me out. You know, it's tough with the shift. So trying to kind of, you know, figure out what they're going to do with that shift and how they're going to pitch me into it or away from it and, and trying to stay on top of being able to, to go back and forth with those pitches. Well, Brett, that, that's a great question you just asked me. What exactly did he do to earn this? Well, he hit 316 for the week. He had four home runs, five extra base hits, 10 RBIs, has an OPS of almost 1,500. And just to boot, 
for the season, he has an on-base percentage of 44%, a 440. Absolutely remarkable. Hopefully, he can keep this hot shot Well, he going. gets a brand new watch for being AL Player of the Week. Does it go with what he was wearing in that interview? I think he gets that watch. It will go with anything, <laughs> even camo. <laughs> well, the Astros also had to make a roster move last night. Early in the year, after Colin McHugh started at Yankee Stadium, uh, Michael Feliz was the long man. He got sent out because they were shorthanded in the bullpen. And after 12 innings last night, facing a very similar situation. Needed another arm. You, you exhausted the bullpen. You exhausted the whole team by flying out to, to uh, Seattle today, last night. So, you know, what did you have to do? They needed to bring in somebody. So they, you know, Feliz has already been, his, his option has already been burned. So they can send him back and forth as many times as they want. And he had a very good spring. He had to bite the bullet in the uh, in the the Colin McHugh game in Game Two, where Colin only went the one third of an inning. He ends up going four and a third, throwing 107 pitches. But then you had the same situation. They needed an arm for the next day, and they had to send him out. And the tough part was, of course, that. It meant Jake Marisnik was the man optioned down to AAA. And A.J. Hinch was very forthright and up front. He said Jake didn't deserve this, but he, he has an option left, and they needed the pitcher availability, and he has to go down. Well, and the situation here is Jake hasn't played a whole lot. They needed the extra arm. They didn't need a bench player. They're not playing National League teams where there's going to be moves, and you need more offensive bench players. So this, unfortunately, this is a situation. Jake will get to go down and get some at-bats, which he wasn't getting here in Houston. We'll talk more Astros baseball, including a long night of travel when Astros pregame presented by Toyota continues. Astros and Mariners tonight from Safeco Field in Seattle. Astros pregame on Root Sports is brought to you by Toyota. Let's go places. Sunny outside in Seattle. Beautiful Safeco Field. Astros have hit a home run, Mike, in all nine of their road games this season. Well, that, we know that's how they like to score runs. They just need a couple base runners or a couple more base runners on. They've actually done a pretty good job of scoring runs over the last few days. It's really been the pitching that has been the issue. Let's take a look at the lineup tonight for the Houston Astros. Center manager A.J. Hinch at the top. Altuve Springer Correa. Rasmus rating player of the week. Hitting cleanup, Tyler White, Evan Gaddis, the DH, Gomez back in center, Bob Blaine at third, and Kratz catching. And boy, George Springer, another guy coming off a good week. Yeah, he really has. Not just offensively, you see the batting average at 282, but you see him playing spectacular baseball in the outfield, which he does really all the time. But I'll tell you what, when he is, when he's swinging the bat well and he's making those great catches, he is a fun kid to watch. Yes, he is. Let's go out to Seattle and check in with Julia Morales. She got the night off yesterday, but it wasn't exactly relaxing. And Julia, I hope you got some of that famous Seattle coffee at some time today. Keep the coffee coming. That's all I got to say right now. And I'm sure some of these guys probably felt that way too when they tried to get up this morning at whatever time that was. Uh, just a really long, tough night for this team. You know, the day for baseball players starts a lot earlier than when everyone sees them get out on the field. They get their early work done. And in this case, they were trying to pack for a long road trip to get ready. So I'm sure that took a little bit longer. But by the time that five-hour, three-minute game ended, it was well past midnight. This team had to get on a bus, get on a plane, and the flight to Seattle, four and a half hours. Uh, it's just, it's a long one. It's the longest for the Houston Astros. It just turns turns out that it happened to be following a Sunday night baseball game. So tough, especially with the loss, uh, the way that that game ended in extras last night, very emotional. But here's how AJ said they're handling the night and the morning. Yeah, we're going to hit, we're going to optionally, I mean, do a little optional work. I mean, it was a long night. Um, obviously, all the emotions that go into the game and, and, and we were drained. We get to the, to the, uh, to the plane. We get in at four o'clock uh, West Coast time, which is six o'clock to our body clocks and, and try to beat the sun to bed. And, you know, I know the guys probably slept in and, you know, dragging a little bit, getting out of bed, and, and the game got here pretty quickly. But adrenaline will kick in. The guys will guys will respond. But uh, there's no doubt that the Sunday night game that turned into an extra inning game that turned into the longest travel of the year is uh, is less than ideal. You find that stuff takes a couple of days to get over. Like, will tomorrow maybe be harder than today? We'll see how we play before I before <laughs> I say what I believe. But it, you know, it um, it can take a couple of days. But it, it I mean, it's it is what it is. I mean, there's there's no way around it. We, this is the schedule that was that was built. And, 
and uh, the travel that was made. So I, you know, I shrugged my shoulders at it because it, regardless of how we respond to it, it it's going to happen. Like we have to accept it as as part of the challenge. And we have a three-game series here, all night games, which is good. We can get caught up, and then a, a day off on the West Coast, and and then we'll hit Oakland. No excuses in the big leagues, right? The the most well-rested guy in that clubhouse was Doug Fister, who flew out yesterday, made it to his hotel. I saw him early this morning. Uh, he was out and about saying I stayed up to watch the game last night before going to bed. So he should feel pretty good. But you got to think about this team as they start this road trip with a tough night like last night, and they're down a guy. Uh, they're... The move that they made last night, bringing up a 13th pitcher, they have one less guy on the bench now, and A.J. actually talked about he wanted to give some of these guys days off in the days to come. Maybe not an option now with that one less position players, guys. Julia, the moose is having some Turn fun around. with you right behind oh, no. your shoulder. That's my friend. <laughs> <laughs> I love mascots. You guys know this. You can't beat the mayor and the doing? moose. Hey, keep the coffee coming tonight, Julia. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Mike Doug Fister got to uh, fly out early. Yes. Certainly that was a benefit for him, and I'm sure he appreciated it once he realized what was taking place last night at Minute Maid. Well, there's no doubt, and that is a very common occurrence in the big leagues. A lot of times when there's going to be a late night, teams will send the starting pitcher ahead so he can make sure that he gets a good night's sleep. But like he said, he stayed up and watched the game anyways. <laughs> he knows exactly what happened. He also knows how it feels. He's been around a long time. Let's take a look at our starting pitching matchup tonight that includes Doug Fister, the former Seattle Mariner. He started his career in Seattle. He'll be facing a pitcher at Taiwan Walker has made eight of his 40 career starts against the Houston Astros. Yeah, it seems like Taiwan Walker, all he does is start against the Astros. Well, what he's done this year has been very good. You see 18 innings pitching to a 1-5 ERA. The 23-year-old also has 16 strikeouts in only two walks this year. So. That's, uh, that's something pretty special. You see the low whip. He's had a problem in the past with throwing strikes, but he's done a good job. Doug Fister, the former, like you said, former Seattle Mariner. He was a seventh round pick in 2006 for the Mariners, and his first 60 games in the big leagues were for those Seattle Mariners. His last time out threw the ball very well. His best start as a Houston Astro, just giving up two runs in six innings. Didn't have any run support. That was the game that the Astros lost to the Rangers 6-2. to two. What did he do well in that game? So you may said his best start of the year. He threw, he threw the ball pretty well. He, he moved the ball around. He commanded the zone a lot there. That's been the real issue for Doug is he's been hit a little bit because he's a sinker ball pitcher that has spent the spent too much time in the middle part of the zone. You see a lot of the times when he gets hit, it's like that mid thigh to belt and he really wants to be around the knees with his size, big six, eight frame, throwing the ball downhill. If he does that right and gets the ball in the bottom part of the zone, now all of a sudden there's ground balls galore. This is a ground ball machine when he is throwing the ball right in the bottom of the zone. And a great pitching park to go to work tonight at yes. Safeco Field. Yeah, they, like Julia said, it's a little cool out there. It's not, it's not uncomfortable, but that's a big ballpark. You know, it's got big gaps. So, you know, if he's throwing ground balls, the ballpark really doesn't matter. But if they do get underneath one, you know, we know we got a bunch of jackrabbits in the outfield and go get them. <laughs> when we come back, we'll talk about uh, some favorite ballparks and cities that are keys to the game. Right after this, when more Astros pregame presented by Toyota continues. Astros pregame on Root Sports is brought to you by Toyota. Let's go places. Doug Fister warming up for his start tonight against the Seattle Mariners at Safeco Field. Astros beginning this road trip and this series. Hoping to get on track with a win in the Pacific Northwest. Astros pregame continues again. Mike Stanton and Brett Dolan. Everybody has a favorite, right? A favorite city or a favorite ballpark on Astros bases loaded. We got to hear from the Houston Astros and some of the individuals' favorites. Seattle. I just love it. I like pitching there. I love the mound there. I just love the city of Seattle. It's like, like a big feel, like a big city, but kind of like a smaller feel. Not as crazy and hectic as like New York, Boston, or Chicago. It's, it's cool. Seattle. It's my favorite. It's just got a unique feel to it than in the other city. I love the cool weather. Reminds me of fall. Fall's my favorite time of the year. It's got great coffee shops and a huge coffee drinker. I love the unique little holes in the walls to eat in and restaurants with unmarked 
uh, buildings. You just got to know what the right door to walk into, and I think it's great. That's, that's my favorite one. The stadium's cool, too. That's one of my favorite stadiums to go to. It's just got a great feel. It's just unique. It's different than any other place we go. And I really enjoy going to Seattle. I love the city. I love the stadium. I really enjoyed San Diego a lot. The weather, obviously, is great. The stadium's great. Uh, you know, staying right next to the ballpark, get to walk to the field. It's very fan uh, family friendly. You know, your family can come out, and we seem to always kind of get off days when I was in the National League over there, which was nice. New York. Max. I have everything that I need there, you know. Good city, good restaurant, and a lot of families. So I have a really good time when I go to New York because I, I be around the people that I love. San Francisco. And now San Francisco and San Diego. Big ballparks, they're huge. But I mean, just the atmosphere there and the nice weather. Colorado's always fun. Um, a lot of the West Coast stadiums are nice. I love uh, San Francisco, San Diego. I mean, I got to play there, but you know, it's just uh, some great cities, great ballparks. You get to enjoy a little bit of both. Boston is, is a blast. The fans are always jacked up every night. You know, it's, it's rocking and rolling. And, you know, they're giving it to you out there, too. Uh, so it's fun to kind of stick it to those guys. <laughs> A lot of split votes, more than maybe an early primary or a caucus in the election season. I heard Seattle a lot, but Mike yes. Stanton, two-plus decades for you in the major leagues. What were your favorite cities in ballpark? Well, mine, my favorite was always San Francisco. Now, you got to remember, I started in Atlanta. You know how hot it gets in Atlanta. And then we got to go way back before there were three divisions, so we used to go out there a lot playing in the National League West. So you got the hot places like Houston and Atlanta, and then you go to the nice, cool climate there in San Francisco. Loved the city. I loved all the mountains, Golden Gate Bridge, everything. Seattle was a great place. I did like Colorado. Uh, the bullpen was very unique because you had the waterfall out there, so you could actually get Mountain away stream. from the game. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So yeah, there was there was a there's a lot of beautiful baseball stadiums out there now, but those were my my favorites. Hey, give me Chicago and Wrigley Field, 2012 Astros last National League game, the Astros banner that flew overhead on top of Wrigley Field. Right. That's in my den right now. That piece <laughs> That's of history. Perfect. Well, so, you got to remember when I was at Wrigley, uh, the clubhouses were still a hundred years old. It was a little different. Now it's all renovated. But Seattle, uh, the players kept coming back to that. Really a nice addition to yes. the divisional opponent because it's different. Now, after last night, that length of the flight may change things just a bit. But uh, well, how can you not love just to walk outside, look to the south of the city, and see Mount Rainier? It's just awesome. Indeed. A lot of fun uh, votes from the guys on their favorite places to play. More Astros pregame when we come back. We'll take a look at our keys to tonight's game. Astros and Mariners from Safeco Field in Seattle. Taiwan Walker getting ready to make the start tonight for the Mariners. They're just one in five at home this year, but coming off a stretch where they've won all four road series they played this season. Take a look at the starting lineup that the Mariners will have under their new manager, Scott Service. Seth Smith, Robinson Cano, Nelly Cruz right there in the middle of that lineup. Hal Seeger had a big home run on this recent road trip. And a team starting to get on track. Yeah, a lot of power in this lineup, especially in the middle. Robinson Gano has hit six home runs this season. Nelson Cruz has hit 40 home runs in his career in a season. So, going to have to make some good pitches against these guys. But if Fister has the sinker going, beat it into the ground as hard as you want. Let's take a look at our Toyota keys to the game tonight. Well, Brett, my key first is to just flat relax. Okay, we're seeing these guys really start stressing out. We saw Cargo break the bat over his Ouch. knee last night. Yeah, that's just pure strength. He didn't, even, he didn't even wind up to do it. Uh, and, you know, but we're seeing a lot of frustration. These guys need to take a deep breath. They're very talented, but when you push too hard, those talents don't get to show up. So just take a deep breath and relax. Get you a cup of coffee. Very good advice. But I want to start accumulating wins within the division. I think collectively the AOS somewhat balanced. Nobody's running away with this right now, even though it's been a slow start for the Houston Astros. A couple of wins against teams they'll be facing a lot this year. 19 times will go a long ways towards maybe jumping ahead of a couple of teams. Oh, no doubt. Even with the way Oakland is playing, there are no slouches in this division. What that also means, playing 19 times, you're going to beat up on each other. So 
just get a few wins here, uh, here early in this season against your division, and things will calm down and they'll be in a better place. Maybe it will start tonight. First of three against the Seattle Mariners. When we come back, we'll check in with the men calling tonight's game. Alan Ashby and Jeff Blum will do that after this. Astros and Mariners tonight from Seattle. It's Houston Astros baseball tonight from Safeco Field in Seattle. The Mariners and Astros open up the series from the Pacific Northwest, the first of 19 meetings between these two AL West teams. Yes, that is Safeco. That is not Minute Maid. These stadiums with the roof open look very similar. Beautiful ballpark. He's Mike Stanton. I'm Brett Dolan. We're going to check in with the men calling the game tonight. A couple of well-rested broadcasters, Alan Ashby and Jeff Blum. And guys, certainly, I think the exciting part about uh, trying to find that formula for a couple of wins has to be the fact that the Astros have played extremely good baseball at Safeco in recent seasons. Yeah, and they're hoping, uh, guys, and thanks, that maybe that formula was found on a late plane ride last <laughs> night because it was a, a, a very late night for the ball club. And following a tough loss, it, it's one of those that's really tough to, to stomach. But obviously, they're coming out and trying to do it again today. And they're playing in a ballpark where they have played extremely well the last couple of years. They have swung the bats, for whatever reason, very well here while going 17 and 11. Yeah, it's a good thing they come through here quite a bit, being in the AL West now, the 17 and 11 record. Really nice, but what they've struggled with is playing on the road. We know that in the past, but they have swung the bats well here. 17 home runs this season on the road, combined with what they do here at Safeco Field, should add up to some good things. Granted, they're going to run into some tough pitching, but hopefully that nice hitting background, those big wide open spaces up here in Safeco, they don't mind hitting in that chilly weather either. So hopefully these things start to unload and catch fire here in this cold weather. One of the guys that's been spectacular here with the bat over the last two years, George Springer, for whatever reason, and the Astros hope he continues to bring it. Yeah, he's got a 10 game hitting streak in this ballpark alone against Seattle. You see the numbers in the last six games. What's crazy to me is that you look at the numbers on his career at Safeco Field, that OPS jumps over to a thousand for him. So he loves hitting here, loves playing, and they really need this bat. It's already going good, but they need him to continue that hot bat here at Safeco Field to hopefully justify some that sketchy pitching we've been seeing lately. I think one of the things in, in Major League Baseball, throughout professional baseball, is uh, that you just you can't anticipate what's going to happen based on things that seem logical. I know that you and I have been on late bus trips in the minor leagues, come out just throwing the uniform on and gone out and all of a sudden you, you just get crazy hot and the Astros maybe are hoping that that's the case here this afternoon this evening. Guys, talk to us about both of you guys, uh, you know, both played for a long time. The idea of change of scenery. You know, you come down here, you have that tough loss last night, but just the idea that you go to a new city, it's a fresh start on a daily basis. You change cities every three days. Yeah, I think players will tell you when they're winning at home, they love to play at home. For whatever reason, it's the great place to be. But when you're losing, it changes things. What you want to do is go to a place where you have good memories, and this is one of those yards. Yeah, for me, it's it's actually the anticipation. When you are not playing well at home, things are a bit of a grind. You actually anticipate going to a city like Seattle where you have that favorite coffee spot, that favorite restaurant. There's things to do during the day, but it might, so it might also be a comfortable clubhouse for you to be in that you look forward to going to the ballpark. Hopefully, this is is one of those plays for the Houston Astros. And I think one of the biggest negatives for the team to this point has been the pitching, and they should like being here. Hey, Ash, I know you're tired. Let Plummer do all the heavy lifting tonight. He's the one that's well, been What are you off. talking about? I got in late last night, too, man. We, we play it that way all the time, Mike. <laughs> Have a good call, guys. I've been working out. My back is ready to carry. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Well, when we come back, Julia Morales will have more on Colby Rasmus. We'll have Astros baseball. The Mariners and Astros and maybe the Moose will make a special guest appearance.